So if you go to the next. So COP21, the premise is clearly humans are responsible for a great mass of anthropogenic CO2 emissions. We've seen that from satellite, we've seen that from in-situ observations over time. With all of that, we've been increasing our global temperatures as well. As you can see behind me, the oceans comprise 70% of the Earth's surface, and it has a higher heat capacity than the atmosphere. So any of that additional global warming that we're getting, the ocean is actually absorbing a good deal of that. It's actually 80% is being absorbed by the ocean. And how exactly the ocean then distributes that additional heat it's getting is through patterns like this. So this is actually ocean surface currents. So that's what these snake-like features are, is current systems. And the colors indicate sea surface temperature. So clearly where we get maximum solar radiation from the sun is confined along the equator, and it gets colder as you go to the poles. And then we can see you get easterly trade winds occurring all along the tropics, and as a result, you're basically then getting, due to land, the current system progressing all along this western boundary current and taking that warmer water north. And that's true here in the Gulf Stream. That's also true here in the Kuroshio Current, basically to the east of Japan. Same principle, take that warm water, transport it north. The same could be said even of the southern poles. So here we have the Agulhas Current on the southern tip of Africa. The Agulhas Current flows south, but you also have this strong anti uh, excuse me, a circumpolar current, Antarctic circumpolar current that's flowing this direction. So the two sort of converge, and as a result, you get sort of get this retroflexion and some eddies actually spin off. So these eddies are taking properties of the water column within this region and are transporting those properties north. So cooler water, again, it's all about heat distribution. That's what the ocean circulation is about. Here at the surface, it's mainly wind-driven, but if we look at the subsurface circulation of the ocean, which is the next animation, this is the subsurface component of that. So this circulation, contrary to the surface, which is wind-driven, this is driven or called the thermohaline circulation. So it's temperature and salinity driven or density. So when you saw that massive picture, this is in the, uh, the Atlantic Ocean, you basically saw that the current system came up. As it's coming up, it was warm water, it's becoming cooler, and it's becoming more salty because basically as you progress north where there's more salt uh, rejection within the ocean, so it's becoming more salty and cold and therefore becomes more dense and sinks in this something that we call the deep water formation region in the North Atlantic. There's also one of these formation regions in the Southern Ocean. And this is what is typically studied. So if, how many of you saw The Day After Tomorrow, the movie? No? Okay, so there is a movie that basically uh, is sort of a climate change uh, type movie publicized by the Hollywood media in which this sort of large scale circulation is shut down. So people then have a lot of questions. Well, why exactly would this shut down? Well, one thing would be if you have Greenland, and basically Greenland is a massive ice sheet, so there's ice on top of land. If all of that ice actually was dumped into the ocean, it can affect the circulation or speed of this large-scale circulation itself. But regardless, the whole point here is, again, to redistribute that heat from a subsurface and a surface uh, perspective. So if we go to the next animation, so how does that manifest in the Earth system? Clearly we know we're putting in a lot of heat and we can see that the Earth is actually trying to distribute that, but we can see the impacts actually associated with that additional heat through products like this. So this is the 22 year um, record from sea surface height or sea level, you might have heard about that. These are from the altimeter series uh, through cooperations with uh, CNES, the French Space Agency, and NOAA and NASA. So you have Jason, uh, to, excuse me, J, uh, Topex Poseidon, Jason 1, Jason 2, coming up in Jason 3, about a launch in 2016. But they basically tell you how sea level is changing with respect to time. So again, this is a 22 year record, and you can see significant differences between certain basins. So as you can see in the Gulf Stream area, there were certain increases in sea level and decreases, and that's mainly just showing the differences in the, the circulation, how fast or how slow the uh, Gulf Stream was going. And the equatorial Pacific is where you see the starkest contrast. So as you can see here in the western tropical Pacific, you had a significant increase in sea level, and the eastern Pacific had a significant decrease. Rationale there. So overall, a good way to think about this, if you have a lot of extra heat being dumped into the ocean, 
um, the ocean actually expands. It's something called thermal expansion. So if you think about a tire, either on your bike or in your car, if you're put in hot weather, the tire expands. If you cool it, it shrinks. Same principle within the ocean. So due to additional heat, the ocean is actually expanding. And the Western Tropical Pacific is one region in which we've seen a lot of this thermal expansion. But also, when we get to the Equatorial Pacific, here we go. So the Equatorial Pacific, you can think of it sort of like a uh, seesaw or, or something on the children's playground in which you have easterly trade winds that are basically driving or piling up all this water in the Western Tropical Pacific. So you, this is also showing a pile up of sea level and as a result, you get a reduction in the Eastern Pacific side. So it's those two effects that are causing what you're seeing there in the Equatorial Pacific region. But overall, sea level provides us with a great indication of how our Earth system is changing with respect to climate. So if we go to the next, so that was more of a longer time scale, again, 22 year record. This is giving you an idea of the synoptic variability in association with the climate change. So the background uh, is sea surface temperature. So again, warmer waters are happening at the tropics, colder at the poles. And this is overlaid with daily ocean vector winds. So you can see sort of this sort of large scale variability occurring, but you also should see some small scale sort of short term events such as hurricanes. So if we look here actually in the Western Tropical Pacific, you can see these typhoons forming and as they form, they're leaving or altering that sea surface temperature underneath. So hurricanes or typhoons need waters that are excessively warm, greater than 80 degrees Fahrenheit or 26.5 degrees Celsius. They need that warm, deep water to form, and as a result, when they're passing over, it's actually upwelling or bringing up that warm water, and with it comes cold subsurface water. So if the hurricane is strong enough, you can see these things that we call cold wakes, which is just a trail of cold subsurface water that's left behind. So you can sort of see this one's very strong. So you can see that cold wake being left behind the storm. If another hurricane actually formed and passed over this one's cold wake, it would de-intensify or vice versa. If you have an extremely warm deep, it could in fact intensify. So any variations with respect to temperature distribution on the global scale. So if this warmer region actually was to expand, we could in fact expect that maybe these hurricanes would be able to move more northward. I know that that's possibly a, a fact that we might be having here in Southern California. Typically, and this is where I'm from here in, in California, typically our hurricanes don't propagate as far north because you have very cold water, which basically kills the storms. But if this what heat area was supposed to expand with ocean warming, we might in fact actually get some landfalling hurricanes in our future. So that's more of a short-term event um, and short-term impact with respect to climate change. If we go to the next slide, it shows you more of an interannual, so on this time scale of two to seven years. So what this is showing is sea surface temperature anomaly, as you can see in the, the caption. So what that means is how far above normal or below normal temperature is with respect to some mean. Here the mean is in fact um, different temperatures from 1981 to 2010. So it's telling you how warm that water is. So this specific one was created to illustrate the current, excuse me, the existing ocean condition from a temperature perspective to the developing El Nino. So this is, how many of you are aware that there is an El Nino that's currently developing or has developed? Okay, so this in fact shows that progression. So prior to the El Nino, we had something that we refer to in the Gulf of Alaska as the blob. It was this very confined, warm uh, anomaly that was occurring within there. As this progression or time series elapses, you can basically see that blob, then hug the coast, and then you get all this significant warming all the way from the Gulf of Alaska down to Baja. And then comes an El Nino that's sort of extrapolating or compounding that effect as well. So some people have been asking, how does this El Nino relate to the massive one we saw in the satellite record of 1997-98? And we can say that it's similar in magnitude, probably even actually greater in magnitude, but the ocean conditions prior to this El Nino were entirely different. No El Nino is necessarily created the same, and as a result, we can't necessarily with a certain accuracy say 
what effects we will get from this. What will the weather patterns be? Will there be more rainfall, uh, more drought? Will there be more storms, less storms? That's still a little uncertain at this time period, given that this storm, excuse me, this event, is so unlike anything else we've seen in the satellite record. But we can see these changes with respect to satellites as well. And we're studying this right now, as, as well as Noah's studying this developing event. If we go to the next animation, and if we want to tie all these different sort of parameters together, so I showed you sea level, I showed you um, basically sea surface temperature, ocean winds. If we were to sort of tie it together as an entire Earth system, what you have on the bottom here is precipitation, so rainfall rates. So you can see where you have blue, you're getting more rainfall, where you have white, uh, basically none. So clearly you can see in the tropics where you get most of that maximum heating in association with the sun, you're getting a lot of convection in association with that, a lot of storms in their fall uh, and thereby rainfall. So this is something that we call the intertropical convergence zone or ITCZ. It just basically means a band of uh, extremely rainy weather. But if we look at that and then we can sort of relate it to this plot on the top. So this is from a recent satellite that was launched called SMAP. Soil Moisture Active Passive. It was launched in January of 2015. What you're seeing on the ocean, what is overlaid, is in fact sea surface salinity. So how salty or how fresh the ocean is. And what you have overlaid on land is soil moisture. So if we look at these regions of where we get extreme rainfall, with respect to sea surface salinity, we can see that the more rain that is dumped on the ocean, the more fresh the salinity is and vice versa. If you have regions where you don't get a lot of rainfall, such as these gyres in the North Atlantic and South Atlantic, you're getting a lot more evaporation. So you're getting saltier waters left behind, causing these maximum zones that you see here. And if we sort of put these systems together, so let's say we look at here in the United States, we get a lot of actual storms passing through and we have a major river system here called the Mississippi River. It drains about 70% of the contiguous United States. And where you see these storms, you see the soil moisture actually increase and you have a delay and you can start to see these purple features basically showing this freshwater discharge that's coming out of the Mississippi River in association with those increased storms. So then you can combine these different satellite observations to say something about the entire system. If you go to the next. So this is one other aspect in which you can sort of tie in the, the relationship. So everything I've shown you thus far has been more about the physical ocean characteristics. This is approaching it more from the biological or chemical aspect. So what you're seeing here is a model simulation of phytoplankton composition. So you have four different phytoplankton species shown going from small to large, so red being the largest, and you can see that the largest phytoplankton like to reside in the poles, basically where they get a lot of nutrients. And the smaller phytoplankton occur more so in the tropics where there's less nutrients. And it's sort of in between in the mid-latitudes, they're sort of coexisting with one another. And you can see some of the physical processes sort of guiding and altering sort of these phytoplankton compositions throughout. But why we care about this is clearly it gives us an indication of how climate is changing and what the implications could be on the higher trophic levels like fish and what it could do for the carbon cycle. So in addition to absorbing a lot of heat, the ocean actually absorbs a lot of the additional CO2. And so how will the system change in response to that is another thing that we're looking at within the different agencies, both NASA and NOAA. And if you go to the last, speaking of the carbon cycle, this is another model animation, but this is showing you air-sea CO2 flux. So the red, or excuse me, orange more so, light orange and the darker orange, are showing you CO2 outgassing. So how much CO2 is being sourced or output into the atmosphere from the ocean, where the blue is showing how much of the CO2 is actually being taken up into the ocean. So you can see overall where you get colder waters, um, uh, you're getting also more of the actual uptake in the poles, and you're getting more outgassing in association with the warmer waters in the tropics. And overlaid on top, just like the animation I showed you with the hurricane simulation, this is in fact ocean surface winds again, showing you three hourly winds, and you see the, the great synoptic variability. So if you look at this for long enough, you can sort of see a 
background state that seems like it doesn't change, but because of these synoptic sort of winds, you can sort of see pulsing that happens rather quickly. One example could be if you were to look at storms. So you actually can see some of these typhoons forming, propagating, and you can see the CO2 response associated with them. So 